Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's easy for us sometimes as modern Christians to miss the absurdity and the obstacle of the doctrine of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. After all, the doctrine of the incarnation is for us one of the doctrines most at the heart of Christian theology and teaching. It is one that we celebrate with joy and fanfare on Christmas on the feast of the nativity of our Lord. And in the tradition of the church, it is, a, it is a doctrine whose celebration continues not just for the full 12 days of Christmas until the Epiphany on January 6th, but actually for a full 40 days until the feast of the presentation of our Lord in the temple, commonly known as Candlemas, otherwise known as today. So yes, if you have not yet taken down your outdoor decorations, you're not failing, you're just more traditional in your observance of the Feast of the Incarnation. I am too, apparently, this year. <laughs> in the epistle appointed for today from the letter to the Hebrews, we're given the why, though. The why of the Incarnation we've been celebrating. The why of why the Incarnation is so essential. The author of Hebrews is clear that God became incarnate in Christ not simply as a nice gesture or a beautiful idea worthy of carols, but God sharing our flesh and blood was the only way we could be saved. Moreover, the author of Hebrews insists that it is only the sharing of flesh and blood that it is not only the sharing of flesh and blood, but it is God in Christ sharing in a cruel death to give his own body to be scourged, his hands and feet to be pierced, that this is what was needed to fully affect our salvation. And you and I might not understand why that is. We might think that it sounds like some kind of cosmic blood price from a vengeful and bloodthirsty God, but that's not what the author of Hebrews says at all. He says Christ experienced our sufferings in his own flesh and blood and that is what makes him merciful. It is what means he can understand the sufferings of his people. Because Christ was tested by what he suffered, those who now experience, experience suffering in their own flesh can know they are not alone. They can know that God in Christ shared that suffering. And because of that reality, God in Christ has destroyed the one with power over death so that we don't need to be afraid anymore. Because of all of this, God and Christ can truly help all those who suffer today. This is the message the author of Hebrews wants us to grasp. And yet, for those of us who live, particularly in modern America, the suffering of Christ, the image of the suffering found in the crucifix, for example, can still be a bit disconcerting. We're even having a little bit of a conversation about this at St. John's with the news at the annual meeting that St. John's parishioner Eric Nisha has offered to gift the church with a rood, a cross, and rude figures, a wooden cross with the corpus of Christ upon it flanked on either side by St. John our patron and the Virgin Mother Mary. Now, is this too Catholic? Some might wonder. Is it an unnecessary focus on the cross when we should be focused on the resurrection? Others might surmise. These are all very good questions. There's no perfect answer. There are just different ways of leaning on the theology. At the same time, I think history can be instructive to us as we consider these questions, particularly as they connect to our epistle reading for today. First, we all agree that the fundamental symbol of Christianity is the cross itself. In early churches, the cross was often hung on the eastern wall of the house to indicate the, the eastward direction of prayer with the belief that it was from the east, Christ would come again. And so even in your home, you would turn east to pray. The earliest images of a crucified Christ upon the cross come from 5th century Rome. Then the 7th century Council of Constantinople required the images of Christ in the church not be the metaphorical paschal lamb that was very common in the ancient, ancient church, but instead that the images in the church should be images of his human body, so that, in the words of that council, we shall be led to remember his mortal life, his passion, and his death. 
which he paid for the ransom of humanity. It was in the 11th century that altar crosses and pr processional crosses were required, or, or not required, but when they began to transform into crucifixes instead of just crosses. Initially, though, crucifixes without evidence of the suffering, with Christ on the cross seeming more peaceful. By the 13th century, though, images of Christ on the cross became more focused on the suffering and blood, particularly as the importance of the incarnation in Christ's humanity grew in that time. By the 14th century, it was widespread in the West that the cross would always contain the corpus of our Lord. During the Reformation, this became a hotly contested issue, primarily, though, with Calvinists in the Reformation times. It was John Calvin who violently opposed not only the crucifix, but any images of the cross himself. Martin Luther, however, did not object to the crucifix. and They continued to be used in the Lutheran tradition in the continent. In the United States, this was not the case because of the influence of Calvinism upon American Lutheran churches, but still, Lutheranism as a whole did not have fear for the crucifix. The Moravian Church, with whom we are also in full, full communion, just as we are with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, also maintained the use of the crucifix. crucifix. Nicholas Zinzendorf, the great Moravian leader in the Reformation, actually had a vision of Christ after meditating upon a crucifix, crucifix and contemplating Christ's wounds, vowing to glorify God after he read the inscription below the crucifix, which read, This is what I have done for you. What will you do for me? In the English Reformation to which we are heirs, though some churches removed their crucifixes, the royal chapels of Queen Elizabeth I maintained them. In the 19th century, under the influence of the Oxford Movement and the desire of many churches to restore their historical architecture, crosses and crucifixes began to be set up once more. And of course, as I mentioned in the annual meeting on Sunday, that great Anglican priest and liturgical scholar Percy Dermer insisted that while the Roman approach was to insist upon a crucifix on the altar or next to the altar, as was the rule in Rome at the time, Dermer said the more Anglican approach is not that, but is to have the crucifix and accompanying figures as a rude and rude figures on the chancel beam as Eric has now proposed to the vestry, an idea the vestry has affirmed in a project we are now undertaking. Now, you might be asking, why is Father Jared using the Feast of the Presentation to do a history lesson and to argue for the importance of crucifixes? Seems kind of like cheating a bit, doesn't it? Well, I'm doing so because of this epistle reading which insists that it was the suffering portion of the Incarnation that made Christ truly able to help those who suffer in this world. And I'm doing so also because contrary to our own resistance to depictions of Christ's suffering in the crucifixion, Lutherans, Anglicans, and Moravians have all maintained the use of the crucifix because of what St. Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians. We proclaim Christ crucified. Stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the, to the Greeks, but to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay, fair enough, you might say, but how in the world does this actually connect to the Feast of the Presentation apart from the epistle reading given for today? Well, I think what is so often missed in the romance and the nostalgia of the story of the child Christ being presented at the temple is what the Feast of the Presentation, what the story of the Presentation teaches us about the Holy Family. Not only does it teach us that they were devout, following the law and bringing their child 40 days after his birth, just as the law required to the temple, but this story also shows us that the Holy Family was poor because their offering was not the preferred offering in the law. Their offering was what was allowed for those who couldn't afford the full offering. The poor, instead of the full offering, were allowed to instead offer a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And blessed Simeon, in greeting the young family, tells the mother Mary that the suffering of Christ will not be limited to Jesus alone, but that a sword would pierce her own soul too. And that all makes me wonder... How much of our resistance to the crucifixion comes from our own desire to look away from the suffering in this world, 
to, to look away not only from the possibility of our own suffering, but the very real suffering of the world in which we live. After all, for the poor and the suffering, the image of the crucified Christ has generally been an image of great hope. Because it says to them, just as the author of Hebrews says, that God not only knows the suffering of God's children, but God has taken that suffering into his own body through Christ. Or as the great Anglican bishop Frank Weston urged a group of Anglicans nearly 100 years ago, go out and look for Jesus in the ragged and the naked and the oppressed and sweated in those who have lost hope and those who are struggling to make good. When Christ our Lord was presented in the temple, it was not the symbol of the end of suffering, but was a symbol of the end of meaningless suffering, of suffering that happened apart from God. When Christ was presented in the temple, when those two small birds were killed in an offering to God, we see the foreshadowing of Christ's own suffering and death, knowing that there will come a day when this child will grow up when this child will come to Jerusalem once more, to be presented once more to the leadership of the temple, only to be turned over, to be tortured and crucified, and that Christ chose that for all of those who find themselves tortured, crucified, and oppressed by religious and political powers of this world to share with them in their suffering. And because of Christ, we know that death and suffering is no longer the end. Rather, that death has been undone by the willingness of God and Christ to take this into his very being. And we, we who come to this feast of the presentation, to, of the presentation today are faced with the question, I think, of what we will offer up to God on this day. What are we willing to sacrifice? What are, we, what are we willing to offer up from our own bodies, from our own treasured selves, so that the love of God can be made manifest to the suffering in our own world today, so that the light of God might finally shine even more brightly, that light that shined so long ago, that shines still today, if we will but have the courage and the faith to place ourselves upon the altar, to join the suffering of this world today, and to transform that suffering into God's justice by our faithful action. Amen. <laughs>